The Discourses of Epictetus, Book 1, Chapter 9. How, from the thesis that we are akin to God, may a man proceed to the consequences. If what is said by the philosophers regarding the kinship of God and men be true, what other course remains for men but that which Socrates took when asked to what country he belonged, never to say, I am an Athenian, or I am a Corinthian, but I am a citizen of the universe. For why do you say that you are an Athenian, instead of mentioning merely that corner into which your paltry body was cast at birth? Or is it clear you take the place which has a higher degree of authority and comprehends not merely that corner of yours, but also your family, and in a word, the source from which your race has come, your ancestors down to yourself, and from such entity call yourself Athenian or Corinthian? Well then, anyone who has attentively studied the administration of the universe, and has learned that the greatest and most authoritative and most comprehensive of all governments is this one, which is composed of men and God, and that from him have descended the seeds of being, not merely to my father or to my grandfather, but to all things that are begotten and that grow upon the earth, and chiefly to rational beings, seeing that by nature it is theirs alone to have communion in the society of God, being intertwined with him through the reason, why should not such a man call himself a citizen of the universe? And why should he not call himself a son of God? And why shall he fear anything that happens among men? What? Shall kinship with Caesar or any other of them that have great power at Rome be sufficient to enable men to live securely, proof against contempt, and in fear of nothing whatsoever, but to have God as our maker and father and guardian? Shall this not suffice to deliver us from griefs and fears? And wherewithal shall I be fed, asks one, if I have nothing? And how of slaves, how of runaways, on what do they rely when they leave their masters? On their lands, their slaves, or their vessels of silver? No on nothing but themselves, and nevertheless food does not fail them. And shall it be necessary for our philosophers, forsooth, when he goes abroad, to depend upon others for his assurance and his refreshment, instead of taking care of himself, and to be more vile and craven than the irrational animals, every one of which is sufficient to himself, and lacks neither its own proper food, nor that way of life which is appropriate to it and in harmony with nature? As for me, I think that the elder man ought not to be sitting here devising how to keep you from thinking too meanly of yourselves or from taking in your debates a mean or ignoble position regarding yourselves. He should rather be striving to prevent there being among you any young men of such a sort that, when once they have realized their kinship to the gods, and that we have these fetters as it were fastened upon us, the body in its possessions, and whatever things on their account are necessary to us for the management of life, and are tarrying therein, they may desire to throw aside all these things as burdensome and vexatious and unprofitable, and depart to their kindred. And this is the struggle in which your teacher and trainer, if he really amounted to anything, ought to be engaged. You, for your part, would come to him saying, Epictetus, we can no longer endure to be imprisoned with this paltry body, giving it food and drink and resting and cleansing it, and to crown all, being on its account brought into contact with these people and those. Are not these things indifferent, indeed nothing, to us? And is not death no evil? Are we not in a manner akin to God, and have we not come from him? Suffer us to go back whence we came. Suffer us to be freed at last from these fetters that are fastened to us and weigh us down. Here are despoilers and thieves, and courts of law, and those who are called tyrants. They think that they have some power over us because of the paltry body and its possessions. Suffer us to show them that they have power over no one. And thereupon it were my part to say, Men, wait upon God. When he shall give the signal and set you free from the service, then you shall depart to him. But for the present endure to abide in this place, where he has stationed you. Short indeed is this time of your abiding here, and easy to bear for men of your convictions. For what tyrant or what thief, or what courts of law are any longer formidable to those who have thus set at naught the body in its possessions. Stay, nor be so unrational as to depart. Some such instruction should be given by the teacher to the youth of good natural parts. But what happens now? A corpse is your teacher, and corpses are you. As soon as you have fed your fill today, you sit lamenting about the morrow. Wherewithal you shall be fed. Slave, if you get it, you will have it. If you do not get it, you will depart. The door stands open. Why grieve? Where is there yet for room for tears? 
What occasions longer for flattery? Why shall one man envy another? Why shall he admire those who have great possessions, or those who are stationed in places of power, especially if they be both strong and prone to anger? For what will they do to us? As for what they have power to do, we shall pay no heed thereto. As for the things we care about, over them they have no power. Who then will ever again be ruler over the man who is thus disposed? How did Socrates feel with regard to these matters? Why, how else then, as that man ought to feel, who has been convinced that he is akin to the gods? If you tell me now, says he, we will acquit you on these conditions, namely, that you will no longer engage in these discussions which you have conducted hitherto, nor trouble either the young or the old among us. I will answer, you make yourselves ridiculous by thinking that, if your general had stationed me at any post, I ought to hold and maintain it and choose to die ten thousand times than to desert it. But if God has stationed us in some place and in some manner of life, we ought to desert that. This is what it means for a man to be in very truth the kinsman of the gods. We, however, think of ourselves as though we were mere bellies, entrails, and generals. Just because we have fear, because we have appetite, and we flatter those who have power to help us in these matters, and these same men we fear. A certain man asked me to write to Rome in, on his behalf. Now he had met with what most men account misfortune. Though he had formerly been eminent and wealthy, he had afterwards lost everything, and was living here. And I wrote in humble terms on his behalf. But when he had read the letter, he handed it back to me, and said, I wanted your help, not your pity. My plight is not an evil one. So likewise, Rufus was wont to say, to test me, your master is going to do such and such a thing to you. And when I would say, in answer, tis but the lot of man, he would reply, what then, am I to go on and petition him when I can get the same results from you? For in fact, it is foolish and superfluous to try and to obtain from another that which one can get from oneself, since, therefore, I am able to get greatness of soul and nobility of character from myself. Am I to get a farm and money or some office from you? Far from it. I will not be so unaware of what I myself possess. But when a man is cowardly and abject, what else can one possibly do but write letters on his behalf, as we do in behalf of a corpse? Please to grant us the carcass of so-and-so in a pint of paltry blood. For really, such a person is but a carcass and a pint of paltry blood, and nothing more. But if he were anything more, he would perceive that one man is not unfortunate because of another.' 